Welcome back, everyone, the, to our small modular reactor panel. Um, I would like to introduce Sophie McFarland Smith at Rolls Royce SMR, Friedrich Wiederbach at GE Hitachi, um, Hans Schoenmakers, I'm sorry for my very bad Dutch pronunciation, at, at Last Energy, Last Energy, and Louis Plowden Wardlaw at Terrestrial Energy. Um, take it away. <laughs> okay. Can can everyone hear me? Okay. Sorry. Closer. Right. Can you hear me? Okay. Now. Usually, uh, it's not a problem with hearing me. Uh, I've got what they call the graveyard shift in the UK, straight after lunch, where everyone wants to snooze. <laughs> but no, you're going to hear about nuclear power stations. So, um, so I'm uh, Sophie McFarlane-Smith, uh, Head of Customer Engagement for Rolls-Royce SMR. I'm, I know I've only got eight minutes, so I'm going to whiz through this very quickly and only make a few points, if that's okay. So first of all, who were Rolls-Royce SMR? Um, uh, we are a newly formed company um, uh, with four shareholders. Um, primarily among those, uh, Rolls-Royce Group, who is the majority shareholder. You may wonder why Rolls-Royce are involved in a, a nuclear reactor program or a nuclear power station program. Two reasons. Uh, one, we've been manufacturing complex equipment for over 100 years, so we understand manufacturing. And two, for around 60 of those years, we've been manufacturing small nuclear power stations, small nuclear plants. Uh, now, in the UK, that's for the submarines program, um, but we understand how you manufacture and how you operate and how you design design small nuclear plants. Um, the other shareholder that I just want to mention is Constellation Energy. So Constellation Energy are uh, previously known as Exelon Generation, are an American um, operator, nuclear plant operator. They are the uh, largest nuclear, private nuclear operator in the world, um, and they have some of the highest avail availability factors for their nuclear power stations um, uh, anywhere in the world. So if you want to understand how to design a plant so it can be operated with maximum efficiency, it's really important to make sure you've got an operator in there with you. And what is it? It's, you know, we had lots of discussion this morning about what is an SMR, and, and it's absolutely correct that every SMR is different. So I just want to quickly explain what is our version of an SMR. Um, and they're not all the same, um, but what we have looked at is the eco economics of how you make nuclear power a realisable product, a commodity product that can be utilised in as many places and for as many applications in the world. Um, and we certainly are not about developing a small plant and delivering it in the way with all of the complex problems that you get with a large plant. So this is about completely changing the way that we deliver nuclear power. Um, so small for us is not about small physically, it's about small in terms of um, maximizing the power output for the physical constraints that we put on the plant. So to get an economic solution, we need to make sure the plant can be built and can be delivered, and we need to make sure that we ma maximize the efficiency around the logistics and various other things to do with the plant. So we ensure that our plant can all be delivered to site is road transportable modules. The entire power station is modularized in our plant. We're not talking about just a nuclear reactor, we're talking about the complete power station. And the complete power station is modularized and modularized in a way that it means that it can be manufactured and transported to, size, to, to site. Um, and it's also about not designing around an arbitrary power level. So the power level that we have, 470 megawatts, is based on the maximum circumference that you can have for a pressure vessel and still transport that pressure vessel on a standard road in the UK or in the European Union or anywhere else. So our RPV vessel is 4.2 metres in diameter. You pack standard fuel into that that's available on the market today do the physics and you come out with a power rating of about 470. So it's all about maximizing the power for the lowest cost of production. Modular, standardization, repeatability, uh, factory produced product. We've talked about that this morning. This is the way to drive down cost out of nuclear. Avoidance of any large modules that need to be disassembled for transportation because then you have all the problems at site of actually assembling and retesting and various other things. Um, and then the modules need to be able to be tested in the factories 
before they're delivered to site to be able to make sure that you get that repeatability that you need in the standardization pro process. And then of course, it does include a reactor. It's a pressurized water reactor, standard traditional technology that is used in the majority of reactor plants around the world today, proven technology. We know it works, we know it can be licensed, so it's got low licensing risk around the world. Um, and also we know that the infrastructure is available to provide the fuel for it, but also to manage the waste for it. So this is not about advanced technology uh, because advanced technology is a cool thing to do. This is about providing nuclear in an economic solution that means that more industries and more customers can actually benefit from it. Okay, and the other important thing to talk about is why are we doing this now? We talked about this this morning as well. What we're trying to do, all of us, I think, collectively, is move away from the traditional model of nuclear down the risk curve so we deliver the nuclear product as a standardised product. And in our case, that means we'll deliver the complete power station as an engineered, manufactured and assembled contract. So Rolls-Royce SMR will own and manage the delivery of the complete power station. So we no longer need to develop a new supply chain for every plant that gets delivered. We no longer need to have an EPC contractor for every plant that gets delivered. That will all come as part of the turnkey contract under a single package, which means all of that risk that we see in traditional power plant construction, nuclear power plant construction, is managed by a single entity who has experience of doing this and replicating this <coughs> multiple times. And the reason we have to do that and the reason we can do that is because 90% of the plant is modularized into, dare I say it, Lego blocks. Um, and those, all of those Lego blocks are pre-designed, pre-tested, and then delivered from our factories to the site where we will assemble them in an assembly sequence. So it's a very different way of delivering nuclear, but it's based on our heritage of knowing how you design a plant and also knowing how you manufacture and then understanding what it needs to do to be to be able to operate it efficiently. Uh, I won't talk about this, but in effect, this is the Bible for our engineering team. This is how we design the product. We look at everything that needs to work to base, basically give the lowest cost of electricity or the lowest cost of hydrogen or whatever its systems it's being used for. So from day one in 2016, these are the design criteria our team have been working to. And, and again, it's all about um, delivering this through factories. So what does it look like? So this is the actual plant itself um, underneath what we call our fourth factory, the site factory, which is actually um, uh, produced by our partner BAM. Um, who've been working with us since the beginning of the project, BAM in the UK, but also globally, BAM will be supporting us in delivering the site factory. So because of our compact uh, site footprint, we can actually construct under a canopy, uh, so we avoid problems with the weather. And then you can see from this picture, the modularization starts to appear in terms of the different blocks that we have the whole power station broken down into. And again, a nice picture but I'm going to talk about where we are, where we are with our program. So, so we are currently in the UK licensing process, the generic design assessment process, um, which is incredibly useful because as part of that process, we can define any set of site conditions that we choose to use. So um, we can actually create a pretend site um, and actually say, well, we want to take the seismic conditions from the most extreme seismic place that we would ever want to put this plant. So we use conditions from there. We can take the temperature ranging from uh, a cold temperature from Finland to a warm temperature from the Middle East. We can, we can make up a site and then ask the British regulator, will our plant work and be safe and operable in those, those conditions? Uh, and that way we managed to come out of the generic design assessment within a, a licensed assessment of our plant that covers the vast majority of the locations that we would ever need or want to put the plant. Now, of course, we would need to go through uh, licensing in any country, absolutely in any country we went to, and also in any particular site we would have to go to and redo the licensing. That's quite understood. Um, but actually what, we, what it means we can do is we have already asked the British regulator to check that we will be fine in the majority of locations. So that gives us a good head start. So we're now in that process. Uh, step two is due to complete at the end of 2024, and then we will immediately start to move towards manufacturing of long lead components. 
Um, we're already working to build our supply chain for the complete power station, so that's already in train. We're shortlisting for our first factories. We're getting our system requirements, supplier requirements. And then most importantly, it was, as was discussed this morning, we're also looking at all of the logistics flow that's required. So we're actually looking at how are we going to transport these modules? What the, what's the flow of the modules that need to, to go to site? What's the construction sequence at site? And then using that information to reinform the design where we might need to change the design slightly to actually make sure that it's, it's optimized for the whole of the design process. So, so all that detailed planning work is underway for the construction as well as the uh, plant itself. And just some pictures as well, because they're more interesting to look at. So again, just some of the pre-production forgings that, that have been going on. These are now created and they're ready for us to start doing our testing on. Um, here's some pictures of the civil module facility. So we are going for pre-production prefabricated modules for the civils modules as well, and that's a facility that already exists. Um, we've got mock-ups of our modules um, at the moment that where we, we're using these to prove out the techniques for uh, construction and also for operation. And then these are just some pictures of some of the VR tools and the AR tools, uh, virtual reality and augmented reality, that we're using as part of the design phase to actually say, well, can I make sure that when I'm going through my construction that I've got enough space in the module that when I try and torque the bolts, for example, I've got space for the tools. When I'm going to do my um, operations and my services and maintenance through life, are we making sure that the right modules are in the right place for ease of access, for speed of maintenance? All of those things are being uh, thought through now, going through in, 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 and embedded into the design process. So all of that activity is, is fully underway. And then in terms of customers, again, I don't think I need to reiterate from the, this morning um, the, the volume of customers that we're all talking about that are out there for SMRs. Um, so again, we're incredibly pleased that in the Netherlands we've signed an agreement with our colleagues from ULC Energy, who are a development company, who are looking to... <laughs> look at, yes looking to deploy in the Netherlands. So that's, that's wonderful news because this is a great place uh, for SMRs to be deployed. Um, we're also obviously working in, in the UK and we're going through the process with the British government in terms of looking at the first sites for our SMRs to be deployed. Um, and, then, and then again, you can read in the press, uh, there's lots of discussions going on um, with other potential customers as well. So the market is vast, and I'm constantly amazed at the number of industrial com companies, especially, who are starting to come to us to say, actually, I think your solution of uh, nuclear power with the heat and the electricity that you can provide is exactly what we need for our industrial plants. So uh, great market out there. So I hope that was uh, eight minutes, <laughs> just about. <laughs> Do you hear me? So while uh, Ty is getting uh, my screen up uh, on the big screen, um, I have something to confess. I know Ty is for quite some time and we've been touching base for, I'd say, three years now, more or less, for the market. Yeah, and I promised uh, next time I be here, I will get in touch with you. I've been here and didn't come back to you. So, so that's the first thing I'm come clean on. And the second piece is that I saw this morning that you have um, uh, our um, reactor technology in, in one of your slides. I think it was 24. Yeah. yeah. Uh, and you said we didn't have an ongoing discussion for those 24. But uh, if you keep it for yourself, we do. So that's the second piece, but we can touch base on that in a later state. We, uh, as a company, have been in the nuclear market for quite some time. We're up and running. Um, GE Touchy is the nuclear leg. Sorry about that. Uh, nuclear leg of GE. And um, uh, in this region, we have uh, experience in BWRs, but more so in the Nordics, uh, as well as in Germany, here in Europe. And uh, it was one of the uh, leading design in you, as, as many of you know. Uh, what happened the last couple of years is that the market has grown. So my role has changed from being a, a salesperson in fuel and services into the more new, exciting things that we're all here to talk about today. My name is Fredrik Wittabeck. I'm 
based in Sweden. I've been with GE for 10 years and uh, the last couple of years I've been just touring, talking to people and many of you uh, about our new SMRs. So the, my lead, my lead uh, picture here is the uh, evolution of uh, a, a way to think that has occurred inside GE. Um, a couple of years ago, we were really unsuccessful with a large unit. Uh, it did never make it to the market. It's called ESBWR. Uh, we were in, that was in a time also when after Fukushima, the market actually went belly up. There was nothing to do. Uh, so we took a couple of hard decisions uh, to reduce staff and was thinking about doing nuclear at all from a new build standpoint. This resulted in a um, due diligence of what is needed. We went out to customers, we did um, um, ask them, what would you require from us in order to order a new unit? And the first response was, it needs to be controlled in schedule and in cost. And we all echo that here today. Uh, and it needs to be a bite size that I can handle it. You shouldn't be able to back it up with a military or a sovereign um, responsibility. It should be a business decision. So bite size was suggested to be a billion. And um, the, uh, the technology should be able to be deployed over a mandate period of a president or a CEO, which is three to four years. So that's what we went to the drawing board with. As you see behind me, that's the design that came out. And what we did was basically said that we can't do anything else than reusing our old, proven, uh, viable technology in order to reach that goal. But we also probably need to come up with a solution that, that utilizes it in a better way. And you can read all about it on our web page. We have much information available about it. Uh, and if you don't find it, please contact me afterwards and I will make sure that you get it. But the bullets here is the main thing that I want to communicate today. So the X in the BWRX 300, that stands for number 10, which is the 10th evolution or generation of our proven technology. We have continued to work on the safety case. Uh, it's increasingly safety. I don't really need to talk about that. Uh, because we all know that nothing's going to get to the market without uh, fulfilling the safety requirements. But it's improving in safety as well. We are basing our design on the ESBWR, uh, which is a licensed uh, product, and it has rendered a significant uh, reduction in the cost of capital. And the design change that I mentioned before was uh, that was triggering most of the reduction in the cost is actually an integrated valve. And this integrated valve have made us reduce the footprint. So I think right now we are below 50% uh, less concrete per megawatt uh, than our previous versions. And that's basically the average on if you compare it to other large units as well. Uh, it's ideal uh, for electricity and industrial applications. Being inside GE, it's, it's kind of neat because when you get a product like the X300 that promises to have a different uh, commercial uh, message and a, a, a format, uh, a lot of the adjacent technology becomes uh, potential to commercialize. So right now we have application inside house, if I say house, meaning GE, for heat extraction. So we can provide that to, to district heating or industrial ap application. But we also can use that for DAC, which is direct air capturing. Um, that could be a feed source together with hydrogen into perhaps the drop-in fuel that we heard about earlier. Um, and we can do that at today economical uh, levels and in a sufficient and needed scale. So that's the bolt on that we're working on that will be coming to the market uh, together with our product. It doesn't mean you have to use it like that, but it's definitely providing an added value. We have a small footprint. Uh, we're working to get this technology closer to the end user because we believe that's where society wants us. So that's key for us to get it in there. Uh, I, we're hoping to get it uh, down to the industrial uh, fence line. 
and not the EPC uh, said that it's currently uh, in most uh, regulatory regimes. And we are working now together with um, a couple of customers, uh, uh, one predominantly in, in uh, Canada, OPG, many of you have read about it, and they are uh, targeting to have the first operational unit uh, 2028 uh, as early, and, and we are supporting that schedule. Uh, hope to have some news about that fairly shortly. Uh, shortly. And uh, in addition to the Canadian project, we have, um, we have more uh, North American projects. Recently, Saskatchewan was announcing their interest in our design. We have agreement with TBA that we are actively working on. Uh, and that's the one that we've been, been public with. Uh, here in Europe, we're advancing the discussions now for uh, it's not a unit uh, deployment in Poland. It's a program where our customer and partner there have announced uh, a um, contract with for one of the long lead materials, uh, the vessel of 10 units to start with. So this is this is not something that we are taking to the market. We ha we uh, in the future we are doing it now. So it's ongoing. It's in the late 20s, and I hope, really hope, that we can have uh, one of these technology or units here in Europe, uh, similar time frame, definitely way before 2030. I'm running out of time, even if I have few slides, and uh, I, sorry, okay, thanks. So, so uh, this this picture here is is to. Uh, uh, basically say, don't trust Frederick, see what he did before. Uh, this is the ABWR timeline. When we took that to the market, uh, the first unit was built in 38 months, second a bit longer, third one, and fourth one, and fifth one was a bit longer, and the reason for that was because we were added some seismic needs that needed to be recalculated, but the building time was about the same, so they added some engineering time to that. So this is, if you know what the ABWR sized reactor is, and we did it uh, below four years, uh, this is what modularization and experience uh, can do. And we're aiming to beat those numbers quite aggressively. And uh, the first units is probably closer to or below three years. And we're working to get that done even further. So if I, wanna leave, if I can leave you with just one thing, before my extra minute uh, vanishes. It's the, uh, right now we're in a situation where policy decisions are made really, really fast. And I'm not sure if all of them are sufficient, if they're gonna stay the same way uh, or not. And I think whatever decision that occurs needs to be based on a future that is not reactive, that is proactive. So we're trying to keep our commercial product commercial even in a future where we have more naturalized, more uh, humane energy prices. So if by investing in this, you shouldn't end up in a situation where you require uh, governmental support in 10 years because the gas market has imploded or something. We, we, will, we will aim to compete at that neck to neck anyway. Thank you. My name is Louis Plowden-Wardler from a company called Terrestrial Energy. I'm based in London, but the center of gravity of the company is in Oakville outside Toronto, where we've been working for nearly nine years, actually, to take a, a, an innovative liquid fuel design through the regulatory process in Canada, which is a process that should be more or less complete towards the end of this year. Um, I'll go through this uh, presentation, and I, I may be a bit unstudied because I'm a last minute substitute. So we, we have a 30% question, and I think some of the presentations this morning were very much on this point, which is that electricity is not the entire game. There are a large number of industrial processes from plastics and oil refining, ammonia production, hydrogen production, a, a slew of um, uh, industries that in many cases, as far as Europe is concerned, have gone offshore to China because the coal is cheaper there and people don't worry so much about the um, uh, pollution of it. So to 
allow nuclear to really do what it can to address the economic um, potential fossilization of uh, Europe and the US, we have to look beyond electricity and we have to look towards high heat. So it, it, I think it's true to say that because high temperature reactors present particular issues in relation to materials usage um, and you know they th th they have not been the market standard although the UK is a sort of honorable exception although with its advanced gas reactors but they haven't really been used for their industrial process applications because carbon dioxide isn't a terrific heat transport medium apart from anything else. So I understand, I'm a lawyer, not an engineer, so don't quiz me too hard on these um, difficult technical issues. <laughs> but the point is that there is a, a big, big space in the market for industrial process heat usage. And this is a, a, an important and very hard to address aspect of the economy. So here's a picture of our plant, and uh, unfortunately, unlike Rolls-Royce, it doesn't quite have the architectural beauty. Although I suppose, I suppose, I, I suppose we could put a tent over it. Um, but it, it is a, it, it's an industrial facility, so it's not really designed to look pretty. And the R1 and the R2 refer to the two reactor units that are there, which are about 400 megawatt thermal and about 200 megawatt electrical each with the turbine building behind. And again, one of the um, valuable aspects of using as your coolant a liquid is that it's relatively easy to transport relatively far from the facility. So as well as having turbines on the, um, on the site or just outside of the nuclear curtilage, you can transport that heat to perhaps an ammonia facility. <laughs> it's quite a compact plant. It, so the the plant is on about seven hectares. So it, it's uh, 400 megawatts on seven hectares, which is pretty energy dense. So here's a, a schematic picture which shows a number of um, potential thermal electric facilities, pure electric transmission, a wind farm to emphasize the fact that this type of system is particularly good at load following and therefore potentially supporting the lapses in, um, in generation from, uh, from, from wind and solar. So the picture on the right is the integral molten salt reactor, the core unit, which is the heat engine, the, the, the furnace for this particular uh, machine. And again, I won't spend long on this slide because it's a, it's a bit uh, diagrammatic, but essentially it's showing that in the cogeneration um, aspect of things, power generation, industrial process heat, and grid services are really three separate services that we can supply very effectively to the market. This is a slide which really has some key numbers. And I think the key numbers here are less than $6 um, millions of British thermal units, a more efficient because it's high temperature unit in terms of electricity generation. So typically a lower temperature LWR will be about 33%, 34% efficient, whereas you're coming up for 50% if you're at 585 degrees, which is where we are at our point of heat use. And again, unlike some of the advanced um, hot reactor systems, we're not dependent on um, high assay, low enriched uranium. We use less than 5% low enriched uranium, which is in the supply chain and therefore is suitable for ready deployment. I'll skip over some of these more technical slides, 
But I think that the regulatory engagement is important. As I say, we've been doing this for um, uh, about nine years, about seven years of which has been engaged with the Canadian regulator, which is not transferable to other jurisdictions, but we have, for example, done a joint technical review with the NRC, and um, we, we think that the um, CNSE uh, uh, process is a, is a very well respected one. So we think that the, the, we should be the first advanced reactor, high temperature reactor out of the blocks. The markets, um, for example, uh, we, we, we find ourselves working with a company called KBR, which supplies over 50% of the ammonia technology to the world. And ammonia is important both as a, um, in the food system, and it's also because it supplies f fertilizer. And secondarily, it's a very useful hydrogen carrier. And those um, folk who are very keen on a hydrogen economy need a way of transporting and storing it effectively for use. So we think this is a particularly interesting use case which we're pursuing with um, all due diligence. Um, uh, so to bring it to a close and to um, really just ram home the message, as um, uh, uh, as colleagues have said, it's a large market. A large part of that market is going to be heat, and um, we really need to um, uh, get going in terms of addressing relationships with the industrial users who need this to decarbonize their industries. Thank you. Okay, sorry. Um, well, I'm very happy to be here amongst uh, peers. Uh, that doesn't happen that, uh, that often. Uh, most of them uh, I, I didn't know yet, and it's also very good to be uh, before an audience uh, like this, uh, b because we have to bring things further. Uh, being uh, the last speaker on this panel, that's why we have the name Last Energy, um, means that there will be there is a tendency of quite some replication. I will try to avoid that. For instance, the the philosophy of uh, assembly and construction that uh, that Sophie was presenting for Rolls Royce, well, it could have been a copy of of our way of thinking. The only difference is is that we are much smaller. Um, my name uh, I'm Hans Schoenmakers. Um, I used to be working for sorry to say, for fossil industry. I've been working uh, at Uniper and its predecessors for 35 years. So I, I am responsible for the last uh, coal plant built. But um, I have listened uh, to, the, uh, to the advice of Rauli in, uh, in advance and I quit with Uniper and I'm now involved with, with Last Energy. So I hope that satisfies you. <laughs> Your mom, friends. <laughs> so Last Energy, uh, Last Energy is the commercial spin-off of the Energy Impact Center, and that is uh, based in uh, Washington, D.C. And uh, Washington, or, uh, the Energy Impact Center has gone through years and years of research uh, to, uh, to, fi to find that the real deep and fast decarbonization can be brought about by um, the deployment of SMR as long as it's built on fully available technology. And the innovation that takes place is not in the technology, but in the business, in the business plan and how it is deployed. So uh, and this is our mission, um, at least part of the mission, because this says uh, the Netherlands. We're doing this in uh, multiple countries uh, at the moment in Europe. There are, at the moment, there are LOIs in Poland, Romania, and some other countries underway to, uh, yeah, to construct uh, the facility that, um, that I'm about to uh, present to you. Um, 
Well, if, if you look at uh, the Netherlands, I will just turn around a bit um, to give you a better view. Uh, I, think, I think we all recognize these, uh, these things. Uh, that energy transition is at crossroads. I, I, I think we could have said that five years ago as well, but it's certainly true. Uh, I think it was uh, in Matthijs' presentation that he was almost excusing himself to say that uh, also renewable uh, power will be needed. Well, that's in indeed true. And we are there to facilitate that and uh, for, balancing, uh, for balancing the grid. That's a very important feature if you look at the, at the current needs of uh, the Netherlands today. Fossil fuel generation is, is getting m more and more expensive and it has the risk that um, the industrial companies in the Netherlands, uh, we have some, some clusters of, of industry in the Netherlands, will be pushed out of Netherlands. We have seen that problem before. The, at the end of the last century, beginning of this century, there was also this, uh, um, this challenge that, that uh, yeah, the, the fuels were simply too expensive for Dutch industry. There was no more level playing field. The answer by then was build new coal-fired power stations. Today we have a different answer to that challenge. Um, we also have to acknowledge that, uh, I think it was said before, that, that nuclear builds are beyond the scope of private, private fi financing. You always need uh, the government, there is Remco. Welcome Remco. <laughs> You're a bit late. Um, so uh, I'm going to say a little, a few words about uh, financing. We have we have heard a lot of it uh, already, um, but I will add a few words to that as well. Uh, the the one but last bullet is a little bit the same as the second. The the industrial customers they are in a in a in a triple squeeze actually. They have to decarbonize, but they need affordable cost and they need predictable cost. Looking at what's happening today, and uh, security of supply, it must it must simply always be there. And another uh, given uh, of the Dutch um, situation is that the power grid is becoming. Um, Overloaded. Maybe, maybe that's uh, well, not as sad as uh, even not as bad as it is in uh, in reality. So this is the general picture. Probably uh, everybody will recognize that. I I purposely took out the scales and and the numbers, but yeah, the tendency is is clear. Uh, we have to almost uh, triple uh, the. Uh, this is about power, by the way. This is not about energy. Um, we, we have to more, more than triple uh, the, the supply by 2050 and at, by the same token we have to reduce our footprint, CO2 footprint, from where we are today to zero by 25, 2050. And, and we believe, uh, and this, this was taken by the way from um, um, a study that came out or was presented to, to uh, the province of Limburg last week um, that from 2030 on they say mini SMRs um, and, and yeah, being 20 megawatt output is, is mini uh, can uh, play a role as of 2030. If you read very closely through the report you can also read that it can be a few years earlier. We believe that it can happen in 2026 maybe 2027 and um, because at, at this point in time, 2030, we all, already have to be uh, at 55% uh, of, uh, of reduction. Talking about SMRs, I don't have to go through this because that has been presented uh, already today. We, uh, as, as Last Energy, are in that upper league, so the uh, that's a nice wording uh, of, of uh, mini SMR between 20 and 50 uh, time to realization but uh, still this is not not our slide but also from uh, the, the study on, on Limburg to be realized by 2030 knowing that it can be a little bit earlier technology is well proven um, what a, what a good feature is, but that goes for most of them, is that, that we use air cooling so it can be um, deployed almost anywhere. 
for the for the supply chain we can rely on Dutch uh, companies we're working on that supply uh, chain uh, already and, and um, in that study it was believed that this is the fastest uh, and decarbonized uh, and dispatchable power uh, we, need a, we need a lot of dispatchable power with all this uh, supply driven um, energy or uh, power coming online that uh, that this, this can play an important role uh, my colleagues have, have presented uh, the, uh, the lower rows in this chain. Now I skip first two slides and I show you a picture of uh, what it is, the facility. Oh. Now, this is a, a surprise for a little bit later. This is the, the layout of the plant uh, size. Um, Imagine a, a soccer field that it's a, it's a little bit smaller than a, than a soccer field. What you see is that the nuclear island will be uh, below uh, the ground, so that well that has a lot to do with safety, of course. And uh, the whole balance of plan is what you will see. I I I, le I leave some fact sheets here, and you can see an uh, imaginary picture here. But this uh, fact sheet gives a, gives a summary of all the important uh, features about uh, the supply of energy and of heat. Yeah. Uh, during one of the discussions this morning, there was a question about uh, district heating. Yes, it is applicable for uh, district heating as well, because it is, it is 20 megawatt, but you can build them in parallel, of course, and, and just replicate uh, any, of, uh, any of these units. Uh, well, all these, these standard components, they are manufactured in, in uh, like, like Rolls-Royce does, in, in, in the factory, uh, already being done. And I, I can sh show you a 58 second uh, video at the end, being done in Houston, Texas. But the idea is that if this uh, product is going to be developed and employed uh, or deployed here in, in Europe, there will be production facilities here as well. Air-cooled, like I said, uh, pressurized water reactor, but that's common for the most uh, uh, SMRs, and standard components. And that makes, it, makes us able to construct a facility like this in 18 to 24 years. And, uh, sorry, months. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah, it's after lunch. Huh? Um, and I go back three slides to give you just a snapshot of typical, uh, that's one too much, of typical um, applications. Uh, this, this has been said before uh, today, but um, yeah, the industrial companies, they need to uh, decarbonize and uh, a lot of them a lot of them need to replace their chps they need base load supply of power and heat at affordable and i underline predictable prices we um we uh, agree or we tend to agree on uh, ppas for 18 years and we can fix the the cost for 18 years because of the yeah the the it, it is the, the refueling takes only place uh, after every six years, so that uh, we're managing to do uh, manageable to do that. So and and that is coming back to one of the first slides. Important to preserve uh, the industry for the country. Applications, basically in, in import industrial centers. We have them in in, in Zealand, The Hague. We have them in uh, uh, Ames, in Groningen too, but they're, well, let's not talk about Groningen for nuclear for a while. But basically, uh, that, that was mentioned before, steel, chemicals, cement, oil, and gas. But also, and this is just a random place, but this, this could be Dodewaard. Um, so as, as distributed uh, base load, um, SMRs are perfectly uh, suited uh, to be installed at various locations. It's very flexible, uh, not, not in need of cooling water. Um, yeah, you can, you can uh, connect it to the grid or not or directly to the, to the industry. So what it does, it reduces uh, grid constraints, very important, mainly in the southern part of the country. District heating applications uh, improve energy access for, for these companies. It's non-wired if needed. Actually, it creates a microgrid uh, backbone. Uh, 
this is um, a, a simplified slide of what is normally uh, used by, uh, by the company. But what it says is that Last Energy assumes the responsibi responsibility for all aspects from, from project conception to, to the, the ultimate uh, delivery of uh, electricity. So the capital, it's privately privatized, uh, uh, financed. Uh, we take care of the equipment vendors. The development and uh, permitting uh, is done by ourselves with, with some local help, of course. Um, and we do the, the, the operations and, and, and maintenance. And we supply the electricity on the basis of PPAs to suppliers. It is also possible that, uh, that customers take an equity uh, stake in it. That's also possible. But Last Energy always wants to be involved then for a majority stake. Yeah, as I said, there are some fact sheets uh, down there. I'll leave them there. And if anybody has questions, I'm happy to uh, answer. Thank you. Hello, 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 hello. Okay. <laughs> okay, so Wait a thank you to everybody. It's time to open it up to discussion and Q&A from the audience. Um, I hope you don't mind if I start with a question. Um, so all of you have spoken about similar benefits that SMRs bring, like um, allowing for qualified supply chains, trained labor forces, lower cost of capital as a result of avoiding first-of-a-kind costs. Um, and you're all technically speaking competing firms in, for a similar space in the market, but yet we're an interesting industry because we're all trying to bring these technologies to the forefront. So to what extent do you believe that collaboration is required and sort of addressing the exact same or very similar issues in bringing these reactors to market um, by a similar time frame of around the late 20, 20s or early 2030s. What do you think is the biggest hurdle remaining and what do you think is a good way to collaborate and share ideas on this? This is for anybody to answer. I can go first. I think one of the great features of the nuclear industry is there are decades of collaboration when it comes to safety. And, and certainly in my experience, 25 years working in the industry, and, and from what I've heard from others, there is never any issue about collaboration when it comes to making sure that our products are safer. So I think that's almost a given. I think um, collaboration around those aspects and making sure that each of the plants are as safe as they possibly can be, which is, is a given really, as, as Frederick, I think, has said, you don't get to play in this market unless you, you can pass that threshold. Um, so I, I, think, I think that's really, really important. And, and then there may, may also be other areas. So I think in terms of um, uh, harmonization of, of licensing, now I think, I think the grand ideal that there will be one license that can cover the whole world, that's marvelous, but we don't see that coming anytime soon. Um, but there's a great push to actually support each other with licensing and actually learn from what each other's done and not have to redo uh, work that's already been done. So I think, I think that's, that's very beneficial and that certainly will speed up the process of deployment. Um, and then we may find other ways to collaborate, just as industrial co uh, companies have done for decades, in collaborating with certain elements of overall product is quite a common thing in the industrial landscape. Absolutely. Shall I hand it over to the audience? Oh, wait a second. Should there's, I, there's more. Yeah, yeah, I, I would just say I echo what uh, Sophie is saying. Um, one piece of the collaboration one doesn't really think of is that we are taking the established supply chain with suppliers to basically all of us to help us deliver this as fast as possible. So the signal value that it, we are moving as companies, but also as an industry in this direction, will be increasingly important to get those companies and individuals engaged and, and take care of the supply chain 
constraint that may otherwise happen. Um, there is um, there is a significant difference now between the old nuclear or the incumbent nuclear, where basically a country asked their national utility to compete three horses in a race until none of them were competitive or sorry economical uh, and then squeeze out the project that was delivered for various reasons on a very very uh, tight uh, schedule and, and budget uh, i think competitively uh, the, the market as we mentioned before is different bigger and and what we will see going forward is probably deployment vehicles being competing each other rather than the technology because we all fit in one way or the other but perhaps not in the same position as traditionally where we were competed against each other so that that's the new thing that i see thank you thank you i would say that two areas of obvious collaboration firstly just having this sort of forum and you know i i think in many cases i could say both in relation to those answers, I adopt my colleagues' remarks. In relation to the presentations, in many ways, I could say the same thing. We, Many of us are delivering the same messages about modernity of production, um, the need for economic business cases. So we're all together, in a way, delivering messages to policymakers and to prospective customers that are aligned. And furthermore, I think an important area of collaboration is in terms of developing a, um, a, a much broader uh, network of human capital and workforce because what had happened in the industry was that when you went to nuclear events you, you, you found largely a bunch of old men, wouldn't you say, Sophie? <laughs> no. And, 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 in a suit and tie. And, 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 and they, 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 they were very nice and collegiate. It was like going to a, a gathering of college professors. And, uh, and they were very nice, but they were also very muted. They were um, reluctant to advocate for the merits of nuclear. And I think because they'd all been through the 70s and 80s and been bopped on the head so many times by the opposition that they'd become rather like turtles. Their heads had retracted into their shells and they didn't want to come out and speak to anybody. Now, now, we are all hiring a lot of people and you know we we've got you know 100 young folk in canada working on engineering and design colleagues here will be doing exactly the same and it, it is bringing that cohort of people through who have energy and ingenuity and commercial nous that is the collaboration that will get this done between us thank you so much Micro <laughs> um, yeah, I think most of the things have been said. Um, events like this are very important, but but as we speak, there is also an event going on in uh, in Oskarshamn in in Sweden, where the basically the, the regulators are uh, sitting together and and discussing. How they how they can cooperate uh, because it, it would in an ideal world we, we would have uh, well more or less the same protocol uh, everywhere because that uh, that would help us tremendously um, so I think that is uh, uh, the best uh, thing in addition to say uh, about uh, collaboration and there was one other thing that went through my mind but it went out the other side so <laughs> in order to save time i will not make you part of my thinking process <laughs> thank you all of you for your very insightful answers by the way if anyone wants the microphone i can bring it to you i've got one as well i'm, I'm, I'm standing ready uh, here my, uh, my 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 municipal uh, brother here <laughs> was first <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, he's on the wrong side of the city, so. <laughs> um, well, just a short question for all the four panelists. Um, I, I, I've heard a lot of, uh, uh, well, good, good stuff, but when do you think you'll reach the, the, the NOAC stage, the end of a kind? When will you t uh, mass produce uh, the units uh, that, that have now been PowerPoint units, so to speak? <laughs> 
Yeah, well, uh, for mass production, you, you need, of course, um, customers. And that, it came back to my mind. What is important, and, and I don't know about uh, other uh, colleagues or other peers, if you, um, if you uh, have, a, have a meeting with, uh, well, let's take the big oil, oil majors, then and you, the first discussion will be with the technical people, and they are very, very enthusiastic. And, but then they escalate it in the companies and they, they come to the, to the real high shots. And they have different, they have different uh, way of thinking. They are thinking about their reputation. And uh, I've seen that in, also in other things that I've done in the past, that reputation can kill projects. And, and I think it could be a joint uh, effort of, of this industry to convince um, these companies at a, at a, at a man, higher management level that um, that it is a good thing. And of course, of course, you have you have to have your house in order to to make that uh, to to make that claim. But that is something that we that we uh, may break through together, or don't we? When? Oh, yeah, that was your question. Um, yeah, uh, well, if you, if you have these questions, if, if it's on us, uh, like I said, we, we can, we can uh, build and, and uh, set an operation, the first one, within 24 months. But the, the, the next one ordered in a row will take eight months. So if that's mass production, the, I, I cannot I cannot show uh, the the video from Houston, Texas. They're already constructing uh, the, some of the, the the modules, and 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 that can go very fast. So, I, I would say mass production in in well eight years or so. Anyone else? Um, I would expect fleets of these machines and being company agnostic here, given the time of citing and consenting processes in, in most countries, the constraint isn't really the manufacturing, it's more the um, getting through the gate of first of a kind and regulator, and then the um, local permissioning. So given those aspects, I would expect fleets to start coming out in the late 2030s, first of a kind much earlier. Yeah, and, uh, I alluded to it in a presentation earlier. We, we have commitment from our European uh, largest partner right now for 10 units. Um, if that is end of a time, I think that's a definition question. Uh, and we're doing it in, in parallel on multiple places. So we will have lessons learned basically because information technology has uh, progressed so far as well. So we will have lessons learned within our fleet uh, in the early 30s, which I would say is approaching nth of a kind. So uh, from our perspective, um, our factories are designed at the moment to produce two SMRs, uh, the modules for two a year. Um, and we have a replication strategy for the factories so that obviously as the, as the volume and the market increases, which we see at the moment, the expectation is we will need to replicate the facilities that we've got constructed. So we're already, obviously we've um, looked at, we've down selected the first sites for the facilities for the UK and now we're looking in other, in other regions where we need other facilities based on the market. The issue we see at the moment, which I think others have talked about, is one of capacity. So we don't actually think the problem will be whether we'll get orders. The problem will be whether we can fulfill the orders in the timescales that customer wants. So, so that's what we're looking at at the moment in terms of where will the factories need to be and what supply chain needs to feed them and how can we grow that supply chain. Um, in terms of the um, uh, getting down the nth of a kind, obviously factory fabrication, we've got decades of experience of the learner curve from manufactured product. So from the very first to the very second, you immediately start to come down the learner curve. Manufacturing would tell you by the time you've reached around the fourth or fifth, as long as you're doing exactly the same, you're pretty much 
down the, learn, the majority of the learner curve by the time you get there. And, and again, we would echo that it, we'll, we'll get down that within the first few years after we begin production because of the lead time. The other thing to mention is, is obviously the digital twin technology. So the whole of the design and the, construct, the, the manufacture and the assembly, the whole thing is matched by a digital twin. And again, being able to use that information and feed that back into the manufacturing cycle, the assembly cycle, the operational cycle, means you just come down that learning curve faster and you can use that information to replicate that learning curve in multiple locations. So, so absolutely, I, I, we think for a factory manufactured product, you've got much better chance of getting down a learner curve much more uh, quickly. No, no, not, not two and a half years. Yeah, well, two a year. Not, not, sorry, you will, we will start to get down the learner curve after um, uh, the first unit. It's just the way manufacturing is. We won't get to nth of a kind after, the, after two. Um, but uh, probably, again, traditional manufacturing would suggest you'd get to nth of a kind around four or five. Which is two and a half years. Oh, I see. Right, yes. Yeah, potentially, yeah. And then whoever wants to buy the first one two and a half years later, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's it's, good. It's, it's, it's a very a very good point. Well, do we have a financial for the first and, and, ag and again, of course, what we're talking about is a manufactured product. So so we we're talking about a business case for a product rather than a one off. Um, so a again, the economics of a manufactured product that you sell a series of are quite different from the way that you price a one-off project. So, so it's not quite the same sort of economics that you use. Well, it's good that you take the risk as a company. Uh, of, of course, yeah. Okay, uh, so I have a kind of continuation to this that you were just talking about. So let's take a look, look a little bit further. You have the first of a kind and the second of a kind and, and maybe the third of a kind. Then I, I want to see dozens of each of your plans coming online every year, like in the after the second second half of the thirties or something like that. What are, in your kind of current view, the key bottlenecks and and, and obstacles that you need to solve to, to radically scale up the the kind of production rate that you can chunk this out from the factories? Is it supply chain, personal issues, materials, uranium, something else? Yeah, right. Uh, good question. The, the, we have identified a couple of long lead items uh, that will uh, improve or shorten in duration uh, during the process to get to the nth of a kind. Uh, one thing that is not mentioned very often is the human capital side. Uh, so we just signed a um, an agreement on that uh, uh, to basically secure the, the pace that we want to roll it out with here in Europe uh, to some extent, but it's by no means fulfilling the total need. So I think that part was, is one thing that doesn't get the signal. We started to provide that signal now to that supplier uh, that we want to make sure that others pick up on and make sure to drive that through as well. So that's plenty available people who want to work and can work in this industry. It, the supply chain piece uh, is a industry piece. And I thought I saw um, th that we were sending out thousands of ships uh, globally. Uh, so the, the, I, and I, I truly believe in human ingenuity. We can make this happen with, uh, with, with high scale and, and good precision very, very fast if we put our mind to it. So signal early on, I see signals in the long lead, other long lead items, the, the larger components. Uh, so that should be cleared also when the, the deployment takes off fully. Well, you know, there are a number of barriers. Um, financing, you need the sort of will to finance fleets that was evident in the early years of the renewables rolls out. For example, I spent some time in the wind industry. Germany had a particular tariff for offtake for offshore wind, and that meant 
that you could, as a developer, have absolute visibility of what you'd be able to sell your electricity to, and it was a fairly heavily subsidized price. So capital would come in, they'd do some sums on site, windmills, yes, I think I'm going to make a profit because the government is bound to buy offtake at that price. That worked to roll out and bring down the learner curve, as you say, uh, these technologies. Um, uh, speeding up the um, consenting processes, uh, making sure that the regulator has enough people to deal with these different uh, uh, technologies and ideas that are coming through and the inevitable um, innovations in production processes and, uh, and, and regulatory processes as applied to those production processes is going to be important. So th there are a number of areas that need um, concerted political attention, and, and that's some of them I'm sure I've forgotten some more, and I, again, I would um, uh, just take it as read from now on, I concur with my colleague's sensible remarks. <laughs> So I, I just have a couple, so um, supply chain definitely, but sites, we need more and more and more sites. And, and actually what we need is, is not the sites to be allocated centrally by the government. We need the government to define the process by which anyone can apply to have a site allocated to nuclear. Because we're, what we're finding is in, industrial customers don't want us to dictate where their facility needs to be, where their power is. They want to say, well, this is where I want to site my industrial plant or this is where my industrial plant is. Can you put a reactor near to that? Now, that's a challenge that I know many governments are trying to deal with at the moment, but there needs to be a really quick way of going through the process to allocate a site to, to, to hold, hold a nuclear plant. That, that I'm going to do one, two, three, right? And then the next four. Yeah. Thank you. Take one. <coughs> uh, George is my name. Um, I want to pick up a uh, remark which is uh, made uh, just by uh, schoolmakers as well as by Sophie, uh, and that's the issue of the sites. Uh, because uh, from a technical point of view, I think you have delivered four uh, convincing uh, presentations that we can expect uh, things to happen in reality pretty soon. But the issue of reputation and sites are commingled in a very intriguing and difficult way, I think. Because many CEOs of the companies who would like to have, from a technical point of view, these SMRs, because they can deliver heat as well as electricity, they have to take care of the reputation of their company in the world. To my knowledge, only the CEO of Dow uh, Global has, ex has explicitly mentioned that Dow will go also for nuclear in its, uh, in its park, uh, in its energy park. But as far as I know, he is the only one of a real sizable company who has done so. And this issue of reputation is commingled with the issue that we have incumbents in the energy industry who only strive nowadays with fossil or renewables. And the secret of a successful SMR is to have an integrated energy supply for both heat as well as electricity. And that glues the company and the SMR so much together that if the CEO doesn't see that he can survive with his reputation, then he will say no and that will be the dead end for you and your sites. So how do your industry seize it to assist CEOs to accept that in tomorrow's world, which already starts in 28, you need to accept that you have nuclear plants at your industrial site in order to save a lot for the world? That's my question and remark. Yeah, if, if I may, um, yeah, for me, just 
just a short action, uh, answer. We we have been engaging in in um, in these discussions. That's why I also uh, mentioned it. And um, yeah, part of the solution could be, and and of of course there has to be done a lot more in, in the in the mental uh, sense with a lot of people, but. Um, what we are discussing, we are focusing uh, on um, industrial clusters, and um, that, that's a little bit different than, than what is uh, depicted in the, in the ELISA study, but we're Nobody's looking perfect. at these industrial uh, clusters, and we've had these conversations with companies, and if you, if you then say, okay, what if we, what if we put them in a, in, a, in a central spot at a company, uh, I cannot mention names, of course, but uh, at, a, at a company's premises that is in the middle of uh, such a cluster, and we have PPAs, then you don't have to invest in nuclear, and uh, but you uh, you are making use of nuclear power, but you don't have to invest um, in it yourself, and that makes them think again. That is an that is an option for uh, for power. It is if they also need heat. That is a bit more complex. So, but y y your question is right, and 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 we are addressing that problem, and um, yeah, we have to find a solution for that in order to get mass production. Can I, can I respond to George's remark? Uh, yeah, I think that uh, this is uh, the question we're asking. Zal ik het microfoon even geven? Het is misschien wat duidelijker, Gijs. Ja, nou, you are asking a question of reputation. And I think that uh, yeah, we, we, we as societal organizations uh, have to step up for this reputation. So we have to facilitate. Uh, people like the uh, plant manager of Doe to step forward and say this is a good thing. Um, and I think the government needs to support us in doing that. So it's not specifically only your role, this is a societal thing. So don't forget that, this is a societal thing. So that's where we have to uh, get the fight. Hey, I'll give a, a, a quick reaction. I agree with you, but it doesn't happen. So far, and the real important associations yeah, of society who have uh, or should have a link towards the energy issue, like VNC, uh, the, uh, the organization of the big chemical industry, uh, the Fenway, the or association of the big industry and water uh, uh, industry, uh, the VNO SOA, uh, the, the General Confederation uh, so, uh, Association. They are silent on the issue of nuclear, yes. and therefore they are also silent on the issue of the SMRs. And they uh, should be, should be. Let's hope that they are waking up with the assistance of the politicians and policymakers. We point. agree, but there is yeah, more than just the society. It's a very good point. Uh, we have been uh, trying uh, over the past years to get into touch with uh, these organizations that you have all these big users, and they refuse to cooperate with uh, our uh, societal in initiatives on this issue because they don't dare to speak up. So we have to speak up for them and to get things moving in the right direction. So that's uh, and, and that's uh, that's complicated because we cannot be funded by you guys. That's the only. I agree. Thing. So, so uh, we're we're probably in. Violent agreement, yeah. <laughs> the, 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 the only thing I would like to add be, be, before we perhaps jump to the next question is that it's up to us to prove that we are safe. And the only way we do that is in, by being reviewed by a trusted regulator that is strong. So when they are cutting down on the EPZ and we can show that we meet those requirements, I think the acceptance and the um, interest to bring uh, supply closer to demand will take care of itself. Okay, um, I've got a question which 
necessitates me to, to introduce myself shortly. If you, um, my name is Jan Rehbergen. I'm a, an electrical engineer and working as a data science for the Ministry of Defence. Um, I'm part of a working group on energy transition for defence. And my other job is as a committee member for the Municipal Council of the City of Zoetermeer. Now, Zoetermeer is part of the metropole region Rotterdam The Hague. And as you might know, um, the Netherlands has decided that we're going to build two nuclear plants. And there are three locations reserved. The northerly location is not that enthusiastic, but the other two, especially Borsele, is quite uh, enthusiastic. And the, the other option is uh, in Rotterdam, basically in our backyard. Um, now, the metropolitan region, metropolitan region Rotterdam, The Hague, has a, what it's called the regional energy regional energy strategy and this initiative um, basically uh, concentrates on renewables, now solar and, and wind for electricity, but the demand for heat or, uh, uh, is not yet really addressed. Uh, so I've offered you an opportunity, I mean we are probably getting a nuclear power plant in our backyard, we should get a foot in the door and get some of that heat. There's already a, 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 a heating system in place for our greenhouses that we have in the area. So my question to you is all of your uh, technologies, how good can you dynamically I mean, uh, switch or adjust between heat and electricity if a municipality, a municipality wants to, 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 to have one or the other? So I can start. The, the, this is uh, probably one of the more interesting questions going forward the, uh, uh, for society to think about. Uh, we, we come from an industry where we use one third of what we produce and throw the rest away. Um, that is not going to be acceptable in the future because to get public acceptance, we, I can see areas, countries, customers demanding that no megawatts are uh, thrown away. So I think uh, here, especially now, if you have a heat demand in, in, in your area, uh, I, I, I can see that come by default in not too distant time. And I, it's actually potentially a preferred way to address the, the, the project. When it comes to how quickly can we move, <laughs> I see Matthias is covering you, yeah, how quickly can we move in, in um, um, uh, load following or, 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 or demand, the, the heat um, graph doesn't change as much. And I would point you to Raul's great work on that for a big heating <laughs> uh, uh, system in, in Finland. Uh, we can definitely do that today and have seasonal production. But what's more important is that it, it, there's a bit of inertia in a heat system that can be leveraged. So you can, instead of load following, you can have demand following or supply following, which means that when uh, variable uh, generation falls in supply, uh, we can switch over from the heat without impacting the heat supply to that region because there's storage in the system as it is today. So I th I, this is the, I, th I see that as a big polit political driver, especially where district heating is already built out uh, in the world. Uh, um. I'm sorry, Chairman's prerogative, but uh, t time's up for this session. So uh, there was one final question. Basically, um, you know, people wanted to know if, 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 uh, you know, if we really want to decarbonize using nuclear uh, by 2050, including renewables, you know, uh, suppose that we want 24 X 316 Rolls Royces and 100 IM IMSRs and. Uh, PWR 25s, do you think that you can get, set up the supply chains by that time that will push out those numbers? So the, the, of course the answer... 2050. So the answer is, if it's on a, as we in the UK call it, a COVID vaccine footing, yes, of course. But, but the, so everything is possible. The question is whether the demand is there. So if the demand is there, we can certainly do it. We, we, but it is a challenge. There's no denying that. Mm. It's a big headache. The signal needs to come now in order to start to ramp up for it. Uh, just taking an example from UK, uh, 24 gigawatts by 2050. That's one gigawatt a year. Yes. 
That's a signal now. That's a signal now. That needs to come through in all those areas where. So yeah, signals. I, I agree with both of those statements, but you know, uh, just to take it back a bit, we always get very um, exercised about these long time periods in nuclear, and we talk in terms of fifteen years and ten years <laughs> and seven years. World War Two was from start to finish, five years, a number of key technologies were developed, Liberty ships were mass produced. All of this stuff is perfectly within the realms of the possible, but you do have to take it seriously. Yeah. All right. Thank you very much. And maybe, maybe just, just to add, uh, I, I concur with all these words. I'm also, I'm also optimistic that, it, that we can do it, certainly if, if uh, there's a cooperation in, uh, in Europe coming up. And to that uh, gentleman's question about uh, Zoetermeer, <laughs> we are quite familiar with that area. Also the heat uh, situation, so we can talk later. He's here, he lives in the Netherlands. You can, you can visit him if you want. Are we done? I'll have it short time. Thank you. Thank you again, everyone. Yeah,